Well, hello, everyone, um, and welcome to a Friday Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath. You probably knew that. Uh, but my guest this week, I am just super excited to welcome uh, Dessa, who is, uh, she's often described as category defying, which I think is pretty accurate. Um, but she's um, um, an artist, a tourer, a, a person who tours. Um, she writes songs. She sings them. She um, writes books. Uh, I happen to have her book here called My Own Devices, which is fantastic. Uh, before we get into it, just a note, this is being recorded for those of us that can't make it live. Uh, so don't say anything you do not want in the New York Post or any other public venue. Um, and uh, so, Dessa, welcome. <laughs> what a way to make an entrance. Right? It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Are you from Brooklyn? Are you in Brooklyn now? I'm not, actually. You know, last night was my very first show back as a performer. So... Oh, where did you go? I was uh, I was in my hometown where I am now in in uh, Minneapolis and last night's show was in St. Paul. Yeah, so the Twin Cities. Mm. How exciting. What did it what was it like? Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <That's> um, <okay. laughs> man, I think I think a huge portion of the emotional spectrum all at once. It was kind of like banging on all the keys of a piano, you know, in any given octave. Thank you for the bless on the chat here. <laughs> um <laughs> I was excited, relieved, kind of apprehensive, and just that I think we've all been, you know, apprehensive because I was nervous as a performer, but also um, I think reconditioning our bodies away from that like Pavlovian response, right? To fear proximity with other people now that we do have, you know, a large measure of protection from vaccines, at least in this moment in time. So that was also on my mind. Also, um, I don't know, there's just kind of a, a certain flood of emotions that happen anytime a lot of people are feeling the same way in a single yeah. room, which is why I like live performance to begin with. And so uh -huh. I think we're all kind of sensitized to that, you know, not having had it in so long. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, I have this vision of myself in the security line at the airport being that person you never want to be behind, <laughs> you know, having forgotten about the sharp objects. Yeah, totally. And the liquids and the, <laughs> all that stuff. Right. Like, ma'am, you're wearing four belts and you have a gallon <laughs> of milk in your carry on. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. I'm going to be that person. I fear that that's going to be the worst. Um, so let's 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 start with um, a bit about your background for people that don't know you, because I imagine my audience and your audience are overlap a little bit, but not that much, probably. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Gosh, OK, so I grew up, as I mentioned, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I've always been kind of a word person, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I just I was really really infatuated with language you know i remember learning the word um fortnight you know probably from like a peter rabbit book but just being so excited it felt unusual you know the, the kind of like um i don't know like the kind of treasure you would tuck beneath your pillow if you could touch it i just i really dug words from an early age and so i knew that i wanted to do something um with them as i grew up and initially i thought maybe that would be a writer but i wasn't sure exactly um like I didn't have a very wide understanding of what genres were even available. So it was in uh, it was in college that I first discovered the genre of creative nonfiction, which I still think is so poorly named because it's such a sexy genre with such an unsexy title. But it's essentially, you know, really well told true stories. Um, so, you know, memoir would fall in that in that category. And I tried to be a creative nonfiction writer, you know, at 19 and 20 for a while by like sending off essays to the New Yorker and never hearing back from them again. It was a very one way relationship. And... <laughs> the sound of silence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. <laughs> it's still me. And um, and I ended up in short kind of transitioning into stage stuff because I wasn't sure how to win on the page early on. So I became a spoken word poet um, and, you know, learned a little bit about how to present in front of a crowd, you know, play to an audience, what worked, what looked stupid. And then after that, kind of transitioned into rap music after meeting a bunch of guys in Minneapolis that had this really cool independent crew. They were um, kind of progressive, but at that time, like they were both aggressive and sort of friendly as well. Um, just a really nice mix, I thought of like constructive anger and uh, goofiness. <laughs> And so it was, yeah, that was my kind of trajectory was, was um, 
you know, as, as, a, <laughs> as, as water falls and kind of hits the rocks and splashes in another direction. Um, for me, that interest in language was sort of routed into music in, in those early years. So, you know, like my mid twenties and then it's like, get in the van, do the thing, you know, the, the story that I, I think we've, we've probably seen told or, or, or represented in film, you know, get in the van, grind it out at like little clubs, um, sleeping on floors, but having fun and feeling young and adventurous mm -hmm. and then sticking with it long enough that the, um, that the ascent was gradual, mm -hmm. but it was an ascent, you know? So now flashing forward like 15, 20 years, um, I've been lucky enough to perform with the uh, Grammy winning Minnesota orchestra, which was a, a highlight for me. Um, wow. Yeah. And I think it's also not usually what rappers do, right? It's not the standard trajectory, but like, what is the standard trajectory in art? You know what I mean? I think it's like so many really varied career paths. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I've, you know, got like a, a, a little bit of, of name recognition as a, as an artist that as a musician that helped me to return to, to the literary world in a more like formal way, you know? So for a while I was just printing up books on my visa card essentially and putting them on the merch table at the raft show. But I was, uh, I did have the opportunity to, to publish the book that she just held up. Um, this book? My own device. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's really, I mean, for those listening, it's a it's a beautiful book in many ways. Very honest, um, beautifully written, I think. Um, and a lovely change for me from my normal fare. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you. We we're not talking about two by two matrices here. <laughs> no, we're not. We're talking about neurofeedback and how to fall out of love. Um, so yeah, that, that's been my journey and in, in that I, it hasn't really, um, I haven't stuck to a lane, but mm. I think that's been my favorite part of it. You know, it doesn't always mean the fastest mode of travel, but I've really, I've really enjoyed getting to see a really wide swath of life, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But your, your upbringing wasn't exactly conventional. Um, I mean, in the book, you, you devote a chapter to your dad and his glider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like just pausing here because it makes it sound like I was feral just for this moment. Yeah. I had, I, my, my parents weren't working, um, both of them had really unconventional passions, but you know, we lived, we lived in a house. We weren't, you know, like I wasn't like raised in a submarine. Or oh, and I didn't mean that way. I just meant that, that, you know, they, they like, I think you say in the book, other, other people's dads wore wide ties and coached little league, you know, <laughs> whereas yeah, your dad so, did different things. Yeah. So my dad, um, my dad loved flight. He loved Elizabethan classical music and he loved flight. So before I was born, he was playing the lute, which is like a precursor of the guitar, you know, and that was his kind of vocation. I was doing for money. Um, as you might imagine, you are sort of paid in medieval wages um, for that. So it wasn't like a gig to raise a fam on. But after I and my little brother arrived, um, he started studying audiology for a while and then ended up one summer teaching um, glider flight instruction. So if you imagine like a a, you know, a plane with no motor, essentially, that's cruising around like a kite in the sky. Um, that was his job for many years. So he built a wooden plane in our garage with no no electric tools that he then really flew around a single seater called the, the Woodstock. And um, yeah, I spent at least some of my summers on the airfield. So it's like a little tiny airport with grass runways and um, when we were tiny, my brother and I would catch grasshoppers and just kind of fritter away the day, you know. And when I was older, I would sometimes be a wing runner, wing runner, which is like if you imagine kind of pulling a plane quickly um, with another plane so that it can take flight and then eventually release and fly around on its own. Um, that plane that's being pulled, the glider, has only one wheel. So if nobody's holding it, it will kind of that one wing will rest on the ground. So somebody me in this case at 14 on occasion has to hold the wing and run as, you know, as it, as it gets up to speed before the, you know, mm. before it kind of equalizes to take mm. off. I'd never even knew that was an, an, a thing. A thing, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. That's really <laughs> interesting. That's really interesting. Mm. So, um, you know, you're a musician and you like to tour and you haven't been able to do that for a while. Um, how did that feel? Oof. I mean, Bad. Bad seems like the insufficient answer, but also mm -hmm. a true one. But I think um, I think this is well for a lot of us, irrespective of our um, of our fields, you know, of our vocational um, fields. I think 
this was a year not only unlike any other, but a year that will change our perception of those to come. At least it was for me. I mean, you know, we had a, the global health crisis, um, you know, being based in Minneapolis at the time. We also, also had the murder of George Floyd and a big, huge reconsideration of what race in this country looks like. Um, and then, you know, the, the industry that I was in, obviously, I would say was among those hardest hit and that there's no breadwinning or work to be done in the way that we knew it before. And particularly for like younger musicians, um, the traditional fallback, you know, pick up some shifts as a bartender. Right. 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 You know, right. that was that was mixed, too. So I think in the beginning, um, a lot of fear, I think also some some very some there was also some sweetness and seeing how the community that, I, that i'm in anyway like if you if i were to open up my venmo app you know you could see just money moving in all directions as people were worried about one another like are you mm. okay man you know mm -hmm. um it was you really saw a community coming to its own aid in a lot of ways and you could see those short stories written out in you know the transactions of between two and three digits online as people were looking out um and then we had a really great decision that was made at a, at a federal level to include performers like me um yeah in, in in some of the unemployment considerations for 1099 workers which is unusual you know so and also in like the ppp loans so we did yeah we did have some federal programs that really helped artists which was awesome i wasn't i to be honest i wasn't holding my breath so big thanks to everybody who advocated on that mm -hmm. absolutely and and uh well you and i share that at that passion uh, I'm, I'm on the board of mccarter theater and i know you're you're coming to mccarter um next year i guess right super sorry this year this year whoa oh that's exciting well yeah, I'm, I, will, I will look forward to meeting you in person then. yes That'd great, awesome. great, great. <laughs> that's great so one of the things that you did during the pandemic as i understand it was launched this series called the ides yeah. So, you know, usually in, at, at least at my level of music where you're making a living and I, you know, this many years in, I'm making a, a, no complaints, like I'm making a good living, but you're not like fame. You know what I mean? You're not famous, famous. You're not, you're not playing a, you're not in the, in the, in the pool of artists who might be considered for like the Super Bowl halftime show or anything. And you're definitely not a, you know, a household name. <laughs> Most of us make our living on the road. You know, mm -hmm. that's like where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's for all the reasons that you could probably just imagine, you know, casually in that like Spotify has really, and streaming services of all types have really changed the way that we consume music. Most of us don't have like, you know, a whole wall full of vinyl anymore. Some do, but not too many. Like I don't have as many CDs as I used to. We listen no, to them. I know. I mean, I, I, we, um, we were clearing out some CDs from, from uh, another home and, um, asked our kids well you know these are really lovely and both of them kind of looked at me were like I don't have anything to play those on Mom. yeah like a holographic <laughs> coaster why would I want this um, <laughs> right <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah and so so I get it you know but I, I get why it's also like you know exciting for the consumer I mean I have I have like my playlists on my phone you know and and that's so nice to have them in my pocket all the time but how musicians get paid in this new model is mm -hmm still very difficult and yet that's easy to do for, to the math right too right? doing the math quickly is easy as well like if you think of <laughs> clearing out cds which is the only thing we really do is cds right you know as i was clearing mine out too if you're thinking man that's 10 bucks a pop you know that we added it up we think we think it was close to ten thousand dollars in holy just, i mean well between our family because they're yeah. big music consumers and um and this i mean this is over years this isn't like one year's worth but yeah, yeah this is the collection by the time you put them all together <laughs> Yes. And it would take a lot, uh, you know, it would take a really long time to get to 10,000 bucks, you know, on a Spotify free subscription. <laughs> it's infinite. Uh, uh, um, yeah, that would be like more than the rest of my lifetime. <laughs> yeah. And so, so what, what is the model now? So it mo so whereas um, musicians have, I think, often had like multiple income, mm -hmm. revenue, you know, st um, streams of revenue. Right now, the touring revenue really does loom large for, you know, for the for those artists that I mentioned who are not household names like me. Mm -hmm. So so the biggest and kind of most important part of our careers from a monetary perspective is the touring one. And that, of course, is the one that we were unable to do during mm -hmm. COVID. So what people still sometimes buy 
uh, CDs or or MP3s. Yes, but it really it really isn't a sizable chunk of the pie chart of our lives. Usually, usually. Um, so during this kind of you know during this really unusual time, I, speaking to my friend and, and manager Becky Hoffman, and we thought the usual model where you work really hard, you write a bunch of songs, you record all of them, and then you put all of them out, and then you run around the country or the world, you know performing them until people get tired of it. And then you go and do it all again. That's kind of the cycle. Mm -hmm. It usually takes about 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. that you're, that's best practices that you're supposed mm -hmm. to do that. Um, yeah, I'm told, I'm told that with musicians, you have an infinite amount of time to produce your first album and then no more than two years to produce your next one. It's exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also like all the feelings of your life, you know, from zero to 25, you know, your first tooth, your first love, your first big disappointments. And then it's like, well, what happened, you know, in the past 18 months that I can write about? Yeah. <laughs> and I think a lot of times that's why you get so many songs about being on the road is because that's the only thing that's happened <laughs> since they wrote their first album, myself included. Anyway, we thought this model can it doesn't serve, obviously, during this time frame. And so we decided instead of recording a bunch of stuff and saving it all up to do kind of a more rolling release where um once a month we released a new song and we released it with like a fancy bit of custom kind of deluxe merch that mm -hmm. would help pay for the campaign because we didn't have touring income anymore mm -hmm. so i was trying to think of like how do we get people to remember that it's a monthly thing ah oh, what if we called it ides because we could then you know release it in the middle of every month and people would remember when they saw that those dates kind of coming in their calendars mm -hmm. um to go and check for the new track mm. Mm -hmm. And how, how, how did it, how's it going so far? It went pretty good. We just, um, you know, our last, it was like a six month thing. So mm -hmm. we did it from January to June. And mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think it went really well, actually. We kind of got in the groove of it. It was, it was a different feeling because usually for release, you've got this kind of one big day and then it, right. And then it plateaus and you got stuff out. This was sort of like a, you're always really busy, but it was fun. And mm -hmm. I liked during the pandemic, um, I liked having something to look forward to too as well you know like i think the way that we all had different kinds of relationships with like netflix and serial art right it's different man you know something to have like a longer term relationship with um with an art project that felt really good to me and i noticed that as a consumer of art i was looking for that too hmm nice nice it's one of our one of our um people that are listening in uh, wants to know how the first show was last night. I saw that. Thanks. You can probably hear a little bit, right? My, my voice is a little, <laughs> is maybe like a couple notes lower and a, a little bit raspier <laughs> than usual. It was a lot of fun. And I was playing with, um, gosh, I was playing with two new performers that with whom I haven't shared the stage in this configuration before. Gosh, oh, feelings, man. I mean, I was impressed and grateful that these performers, you know, who we just met a couple days ago to like really, really grind it all out and get ready for our first show back. They did such great work. The crowd was really, really generous. You know, there's a lot of moments where um, it was possible to just kind of extend the microphone their way and have them share in the chorus, you know, or, or, or sing a line or two. I'd forgotten that feeling, man. That one's that one you don't get anywhere else. You know, yeah, that's not a Zoom. <laughs> that's not Zoom. Um, yeah, that kind of collective and communal feeling. It went really well. And, you know, I have a, one of the Ides tracks is called Terry Gross. Uh -huh. I, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a bit, I think also as you are like a big public radio nerd <laughs> and, um, the club that I played the yesterday called the turf club in St. Paul agreed to put a drink on their menu called the dairy gross for, uh, <laughs> Which uh, which is white wine through a Twizzler in reference to a relation uh, to a to a lyric of the song in her honor. So it was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So are you seeing are you seeing this is the thing you're going to be doing next? Um, going back to kind of the rhythm that you had before. Hmm. I definitely will today because I have a show <laughs> that I have to sound check for at about five. So yes, I think we're back in it. I mean. I think probably like a lot of people though, musicians have also reconsidered now that we had a pause, which is so mm -hmm. unusual, you know, and kind of a forced 18 months of introspection, how should it come back? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think in the same way that 
for a lot of industries that were offline where um, there's not, yeah, just an opportunity to reconsider best practices. Mm -hmm. um, even today, I was like, oh, you, it's possible to learn to reuse your voice now that you're getting back into it in a different way, like reconsider some of the old habits that you have. Mm -hmm. um, also, I don't have an answer to this. So this is maybe me. This is me talking about a problem before I have a solution for it. But mm -hmm. I think you'll probably be more aware of like the environmental um, taking so many flights. I fly a lot. I don't know how to fix that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm more aware of that about like how much gas, man, my industry sucks up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I had a moment uh, this last week when I'm, I'm like you, you know, I write books and nobody can make a living unless you're, you know, <laughs> a world famous author. You're not going to make a living on book royalties. Um, so it's, you know, income from other sources and uh, like you fly a lot. And uh, I was I was for the very first time organizing a trip last week and I had completely repressed how much is involved, you know, like, how am I getting to the airport? And what, what do I need to do in advance? And what's, I mean, it's just like, it, I must have spent two hours on nothing but logistics. Yes. <laughs> just, yes. And I'd completely forgotten what that was like. That's funny. I mean, so, you know, last night at the, at the club, um, you know, all the musicians arrive early to set up their stuff and sound check. And it was a lot of people's first night back. So not just the musicians, but like, um, super pro veteran sound tech named Randy, who's been in the industry forever, but we'd like forgotten the words that we used to use, you know? So it's like, could you um, take that away? Which is called spiking, you know? Could you put the tape on the ground, which is called marking? Like you're too far to the, which is stage left? You know, just all of us kind of shaking the rust off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be, I think we're gonna see some amazing kind of now that we're here stories uh, I do too. About, about, you know, just what it's like to move into this thing. And people keep constantly use the phrase new normal, which makes me nuts because hmm. whatever normal was before, A, it wasn't that great. I mean, there were parts of it that really weren't that great. And B, like, like we're evolving. As you said, we've, we've gone through these major inflection points on, you know, personal health, e economy, race. I, I would hate to think it just snaps back to being, you know, be, leave it to beaver you know, yeah. again, right? Yeah. I would hope we'd have learned something. And I, I mean, this, okay, so this is both sentimental and maybe unduly pessimistic, but, you know, when we, when we hear stories, whether they're um, anecdotal or like whether they're captured in, in a book or in film of the way that like a people, whether that's a city or a nation state, um, like pull together in times of hardship, you know, so you get the stories, World War, you know, I think of like World War II and, you know, stories maybe from London or something, that, you know, during bombings and what the community felt like then. I mean, it does feel like, you know, adversary has adversarial conditions, um, have this way of, you know, forging community ties, you know, of, of necessity, but then we all forget and start right bickering and sniping at each other because somebody's on our lawn right until the next <laughs> bomb drops i mean i would hope that one of the things i think we were doing during covid was like you really really were aware if uh if a driver cuts you off or if somebody like snaps like snaps at you um you know at the grocery store that like you truly do not know um the depth of hardship that that person might be in at the moment. They might also just be kind of jerky, but you just don't know, you know, like they could be mom ill at home. They could be freaking out because you're too close because they're immunocompromised. They could have lost, you know, everyone in their family could have just lost their job. I hope that we keep that part because it was always true that we never knew the depth of hardship that was being suffered by the person in front of us in the grocery store. And I think there was sort of an ethos where we encouraged one another, if we could, to like lean kind, you know what I mean? In your in your response. It's possible to snap back and like start a scene, you know, at Rainbow Foods. Or you could say, I'm sorry, please <laughs> go ahead. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been- Sometimes, because you're also, you know, spun oh, yeah. up. Oh yeah. But I hope- I've been, I've been trying to really be mindful of that. And, and sort of how do you bring the temperature down? Like, and um, I had a friend who was uh, kind of on the brink of starting a really big altercation. And I said, whoa, 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 like what's the best outcome here? Yeah, like right. what, what is it you really want to accomplish aside from the 
temporary satisfaction of telling the person they're a jerk. (laughs) And when you ask that question, it really changes the the equation a lot, I think. I think so too. What's the big win? And it's not that I'm the hero, right, of aisle five, because I (laughs) cussed out somebody really, really loud. It could be a book chapter title. (laughs) The The hero hero of aisle five. five. Yeah, totally. A song title even. (laughs) And it's just a long hyphenated insult, yeah. (laughs) Right. Um, So uh, Frank Calbert wants to know, um, what are your thoughts about inviting people to sing play with you for apps or technologies such as Smule? No, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, I haven't done too much online collaboration in that way. So like, if I imagine, do you, do you, did, you, did you like watch any of the sea shanty moment? There was like a moment when a guy on TikTok. Um, oh, I heard about it. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of like these community music making apps or apps that can be used that way where one person will record themselves um, and other people join in. And Frank, if that's not what you're asking about, correct me in the chat. Um, I haven't done too much of that. I've enjoyed it. That sea shanty joint was awesome. I spent <laughs> as much time as anybody else like going down the rabbit hole on YouTube to see how many versions of the thing there was. <laughs> right. Yeah, I did. I really liked it. But I haven't I haven't done too much of that myself. The one thing I have done um, during the pandemic in a very lo-fi way was I did even during the height of it, try to do some collaborations for like live streaming. So I had like a weekly live show, like just on Instagram live, very low production value and just from my telephone, you know, um, called the show of force majeure. And by coincidence, the woman who lived next to me, um, in the apartment that I'm sitting in right now was a violinist. And so she would step out of her apartment and I would step out of my apartment and we'd keep our six feet, but we'd have the phone set up on a tripod down the hall and we could collaborate in that way for a live mm-hmm. show. And on the other end, um, the Minnesota Orchestra put together a really cool, a really cool virtual collaboration where members of their, you know, symphonic orchestra recorded themselves and uh, both like audio and video and I recorded myself singing a song that I had written called Skeleton Key, like sitting in my bathtub. And then their killer editor, Frank, put it all together so that it plays as like a really beautiful um, kind of chamber piece almost. So that was one of the two things. Mm -hmm. How did you get to play with them? Because that sounds like a really interesting opportunity. Oh, my gosh. It totally was. Um, I I got an email, essentially, that was like, hey, you know, the, the Minnesota Orchestra, who does some really like really rad educational and community events. Um, they they have a pops program. So that's the stuff that isn't, you know, in the classical canon. And um, they asked if I would want to collaborate. This is a few years ago now. And I, yes, yes, I do. I remember I made a PowerPoint to try to like convince them on our first meeting that this was a good idea to invite me. And they thought that was kind of extra. Like, uh, okay, it's over. I was ready to go. My answer was yes and yes and yes. So we did a really beautiful show together um, where, you know, we've got like upwards of 75 virtuosic players on stage. You know, huge, a huge wow. production in their beautiful orchestra hall in Minneapolis. Uh-huh. And and I was able to work with a, an, an arranger who I really like, who helped also, um, I don't want to say bridge the gap, but like he found, he found some really the best parts of both worlds, you mm-hmm. know, so mm-hmm. that the rap songs that I was performing still felt like driving a lot of them, but they also took advantage of <clears throat> the intricacies and the dynamic big ups, huge, quiet little moments that an orchestra is possible, of, which isn't how a club show works. You know, if you get too <laughs> quiet, all of a sudden you can hear the the ice machine. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. Now you talked about um, craft, building, building a craft. And, you know, you've been doing this a while. And but how how do you think about that? How do you think about like improving what you do um, hmm. on a regular basis? Um, OK, let's see. I had a frank conversation last night at about mm, just before, I don't know, just before 1 a.m. as we were driving home from the club um, with my bandmate, Aviva J. And she, and I asked her about the balance when she's on stage of how careful she's minding the musicality, which means how good do you sing? Are you always on key? Is the tone nice and clear, right? Mm-hmm. 
versus some of the performative demands. So for example, I was singing a song yesterday called the Chaconne and the Chaconne um, is like a story song. It's a ballad. It goes real high at the end, you know? So it's one of those things where like, yeah, if you do good, you know, mm -hmm. if you do it well, the audience goes, yeah, at the end, cause it's a big dramatic moment. I would prefer to sing that song in front of a crowd carefully to do it really well. Cause the notes are hard to hit at the end. Mm -hmm. I've done that song a lot. And I'm kind of sad that if I stand still and sing it beautifully and I look around the room, I can see the audience's eyes wandering. I can see some faces illuminated from below by blue light, which means they're checking their texts. Which I would <laughs> means that I have to do better. Um, if I move around, if I take my microphone off my stand and I move around and I really emote, people will stay with me and I got them and I can win them, but it doesn't sound as beautiful. So one of the things that we were talking about is the kind of ratio um, and the prioritization of musicality versus a performative presence. So that's a conversation, for example, in China. I really want to get that balance. I want to shift it a little bit, but I'm struggling to find out how. So we talked about techniques and I talked about getting a better eyebrow liner so that people from afar could see like, thinking about theater, how theater does it, not for, not for aesthetic beauty stuff, but just to make sure that gestures are visible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So painting some of the features of my face so that from 40 feet in a, in a dark room, you can see what's happening there so that I don't then have to rely so much on jumping. Stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, you talk about the, the performance being very physical. Um, yeah. I, yeah, at least for me, I mean, I think, you know, it's in part because like I, I cut my teeth and grew up in like this kind of indie hip hop world where it's like you burn a bunch of calories, you know, during a one hour set, there's jumping, there's, you know, there's just a lot of jumping and, um, and it's fun and you sometimes crash into one another and it's, uh, you know, it's like a third sport, <laughs> um, and two thirds concert. And that's the vibe. It's perfect for that. But mm -hmm. you're also not doing a lot of crazy singing usually. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mostly rapping in that world. And so I do during in my solo shows, I do some rapping, but I do a lot of singing too. Mm -hmm. And so to try to figure out how to cater my performance style to showcase both the music and to keep the audience who expects a certain level of mm -hmm. animation by virtue of how we all met, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the genre in which we met, that's been something that I think about a bit, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. There's a, there's a lot of theory that, um, you know, when you develop this deep capability of doing anything human, right, that it actually opens up a channel in your brain, you know, and there was a, a little meme going around, I think last month about why does Jerry Steinfeld, St Seinfeld still work so hard. Mm -hmm. And it's because having perfected that craft, you know, if you stop doing it, the, the channel begins to narrow. And, oh, and mm -hmm. that, that really struck me. I thought that was, that's such an interesting way of thinking about it, because you're not doing it for the money, you're not doing it for the you know, whatever it's, it's because it's, it's a finely honed, um, craft <laughs> that you wouldn't have if you, if you didn't keep it up, if you didn't keep doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think, gosh, I'm, I'm bummed because I can't remember the name of the pianist. Mm -hmm. So this, so, so, so if you're going to share this anecdote, Google the dude, it might've been Rachman enough, but like there was an interview with a concert world-class pianist talking about, um, like rehearsal regimen. Mm -hmm. And he said, if I don't practice for one day, I can hear it. If I don't practice for two days, my wife can hear it. And if I don't practice for three days, the world can hear it. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. Um, so in the book, you talk about time and in investing time in your career and that you're happy with the trajectory. You're just not happy with the speed. <laughs> And um, has that changed now with the, with the Janet Yellen song and all the attention that's creating? Oh, yeah, a little bit it has. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I'd say in some ways, I think maybe not my, there's been a tempering a little bit of my ambition. No, not a tempering, a redirection. Mm -hmm. that I, I really wanted to not make any artistic compromises and be as big as I possibly could. Like I wanted to, sh to share this music with as many people as I could. And rightly or wrongly, my idea was that I don't have a hundred percent capture rate, meaning not everybody, of course, who listens is going to like it, but I had like a decent capture rate. And if I could perform in front of a room of people, um, a, a, 
very often a, a decent chunk of them would dig it. So mm-hmm. I just thought, gosh, this is like an, it's an exposure issue. Um, my songs aren't like, they're not all danceable, although I like dance music too, but you know, they often lead lean a little bit literary. They're not mainstream for a variety of reasons, you know? Um, and <clears throat> I write about topics that aren't always on the radio. I use words that aren't like on we, you know, I mean, which I think everybody heard is on weed. Um, right. <laughs> um, I had really, that was a failure of articulation on my part, but I wanted, I want, I, I, I felt like there was this sort of industry understanding that doing smart stuff wouldn't work mm-hmm. in a mainstream way. And I was like, I think that there's a place for it at least. Mm-hmm. I think it can have a bigger seat at the table. And I think we are underestimating the tastes of listeners. Mm-hmm. We all know smart people, but then we imagine it's a stupid public. I think there's room. Like, I think there's room to try. So I was frustrated by the mm-hmm. rate of ascent. I felt like, gosh, I eventually, I'm getting bigger. You know, we're getting bigger every year. More people are hearing it, but so gradually that I'll be dead by the time I'm trying to get where I'm going. <laughs> Now I feel like a I have been lucky in that there is like a small uptick in the mm-hmm. <clears throat> in the rate of ascent, mm-hmm. but also I'm trying to redirect my energy to like are you making the best work that you possibly can? This will win now or this year or it won't. But is there a way to transition a lot of that ambition into craft concerns mm-hmm. as opposed to into? Twitter likes or whatever. <laughs> right. So, it does. Like I, I, I was, I think I was also just like disappointed in my own interest in some of those metrics. I mean, some of them just felt like so adolescent and they totally got me. It was, that was quantifiable. Oh, I know. hard to tell how you're doing. Like, why do I care? Why do I care how many Instagram followers I had, but who did I care? <laughs> you know? It's funny how that stuff kind of, kind of gets into your psyche. hundred um, percent. You know, and, and there, I mean, there are a lot of smart people I know who just have sworn off all that stuff completely. Um, And yet the flip side is if you don't pay attention to it, you know, there's a lot of, you just disappear for a lot of people. Um, Yeah. I mean, it does feel, it does feel like a necessity right now for the way that my business works. And that like, um, you know, so much of our communication now is direct to listener. Whereas it used to be like mediated by if everyone's watching the, I don't know, like the Ed Sullivan show or even flash forward 20 years, if everyone's listening to the same radio stations, there's there's like these moderated mediated channels right but now so much of yeah like now much of so much of music discovery is really the you know the consumer like on youtube or getting a text from a friend like this yeah well there was a piece um just recently chronicling the fact that even the most popular like television show mass market television show Uh that comes out right now gets an audience of maybe four million people and if you go back you know, 30 years when there were three channels and you didn't have 500 channels with nothing on. Um, but, you know, you could amass a viewership of 40 or 50 million yeah. people and that just doesn't exist anymore. It's, we've really fragmented into our own little media, media consuming channels. Um, and I think that's a mass experiment. I'm going to be very interested to see how that all works out because I think today it's entirely possible to live in your own self-curated bubble and I'm um, you know we'll see I'm sure there are good things about it and not so good things about it yeah totally <laughs> it's going to produce unexpected results it occurs to me not all of our listeners know about the um Janet Yellen story so maybe if you indulge us and just sort of talk about how it came about yeah um so when President Biden announced that his nomination for the Secretary of Treasury would be Dr. Janet Yellen. He kind of made like an offhand comment in an interview, like, hey, we should get a Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton, to write up her a song, you know? And the APM, American Public Media Show, Marketplace Money, the radio show, was like, yo, I, w- I wonder if we could take him up on that. That would be really funny. Who could we get to write a song about Janet Yellen? And so they hit me up and um and asked if i'd be game and i was like this sounds hilarious when is it due and they were like three weeks i was like absolutely no i just i can't too so fast how would we do it and then you know we pushed the deadline a little bit and i got together with a couple of my long-term collaborators uh to you know on the beat right Mm -hmm. i don't i don't do too much beat making so laser beak and andy thompson made this like super catchy like kind of hip-hop but kind of musical theater beat you know and then i started watching janet yellen speeches and Looking at image like, okay, so she always rocks the bob and she's got those, you know, she's got these cool, you and I also like them. It looks like cool oh, pop yeah. collars. Like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and, uh, oh, the collar's so, yeah. super important. <laughs> I love them. I love them. 
but so I wrote like a, you know, a 90 seconds, a 90 second song. And then to our sort of like delight and astonishment that went kind of viral briefly. So Janet Yellen tweeted about it and the I love that. US Treasury <laughs> tweeted about it. And it was on, you know, the morning shows. Yeah, it was <laughs> a strange, cool moment. And all of my relatives were like, oh, this career is going to work after all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and do you, do you think it is making a difference? Do you think it's bringing, I mean, I'm, certainly it's bringing you to new audiences, I would think. Interesting. I mean, yes, I would say every, like I've, I've had a few of those moments, like, okay. So I think like a lot of times we think of like the narrative in the arts, particularly like in, in music is like, what was your big break? Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe in part due to the kind of fragmentation that you've talked about, but also just the way that like underground, uh, excuse me, that independent artworks. I feel like it's not a single break. It's a series of important oh, yeah. fractures. Yep, yep, yep. So this was an important fracture for me. It, it's not like it's not like all of a sudden my profile skyrocketed. I mean, for a few days, it felt pretty rad. But <laughs> then the question is, okay, like of those people who are like, oh my gosh, it's a funny song, you know, like, oh, this is hilarious. How many people are actually going to then engage with like the rest of your content mm -hmm. and material? That's a smaller number, mm -hmm. obviously, right? So mm -hmm. we did our best to kind of run around and I tried to like be engaging and welcoming on my social media sites for people who are just kind of coming like who oh, is this a, is this the lady who wrote that song to say hey come aboard there's other stuff you know uh -huh. Uh -huh. So yeah i think we did i think we got a boost it's not like life-changing but yeah it felt great yesterday at the show um so our first show back after the mm -hmm. pandemic there was definitely a finance dude who was like yelling jenna yell it you know i never heard you before jenna yell it. so <laughs> we want some that's great. And I was listening to a show and getting ready for this where you actually got like major thumbs up from an economist. <laughs> we said your job from now on is to write, you know, the the the, the tagline for all future economists that become famous. <laughs> I thought that I was did some great. research on that one, man. I did some research, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you, clearly, yeah, clearly. I mean, it you know, it's a it's a fun song, but it's also like every word counts in that song. Right. Um and you know, for those that know, it 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 it, it has a lot of meaning. Um that that's fantastic. Yeah, I think the the whole kind of so the story that, that this makes me think of is a story a friend of mine researched about the Mona Lisa. You know, probably the most famous painting in the world. But for her first three four hundred years, she was just one of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings. You know, and that was great. And then um, an Italian loyalist uh, was working for the Louvre, and he smuggled the painting out of this French museum and brought it back to Italy. And this started like a global conversation about this painting. And um, and so what my friend, the researcher did was he studied like newspaper reports about it. And this happened in I think 1911, something like that. Um, but if you looked at the newspaper reports, like after this very dramatic thing had happened, um, all of a sudden now people were talking about, oh, you know, the craft of the of the expression and the softness of her face and the, the, the you know, the magic of her eyes. And, and, and eventually, with great fanfare, there, there was a big negotiation between France and Italy, and they agreed to return the painting to the Louvre because it you know, had been stolen. But before the painting was returned, the two governments negotiated this kind of farewell to Italy tour for this painting. <laughs> and to the extent that now we all know the Mona Lisa, and it's supposed to be one of the most famous paintings in the world, but this completely random thing happened that oh. is now being looked at through the lens of, oh, well, it must be this incredibly important piece of art for it to have had that experience. And I often think of fame like that. You know, you just never know what the thing is, like some, some guy with a chip on his shoulder stealing the painting is gonna make that kind of difference. It's fascinating. Okay, that is a great. I've never heard that story. That is a great story. And it makes me think, A, I need to get someone to steal my records before I release there them. There you go. Generate yeah. some buzz. But also just like, isn't that us? Like, well, when you have her, you don't want her. You know, like, like gosh, right. man. It's only it's only when she it's only when she leaves. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, yeah, you know, and there are people who have massively benefited from that kind of thing, which, which, which is very interesting to me that, that, you know, the, the random things that, like the myth we tell ourselves, I think, is if I get really, really good at my craft and I uh -huh. you know, put endless hours of work in and I'm really smart and I'm really sharp, that the world is going to notice. And, and yeah. you know, I think, I mean, it's a great narrative and I'm not saying don't work hard and don't be sharp and don't be, but often the thing that really draws you to other people's attention is this this kind of thing, right? Grant, kind of I, thing. Yes, I think there is so much chance, but I think also, um, do I think, uh, yeah, I think that promotion and all that that word can mean in this industry 
for understandable reasons can sometimes be sort of a dirty word because mm -hmm. nobody wants to receive like a tweet or a text message in all caps like yo this is your next favorite jam or you know or you don't want to be like a, to adopt a used car salesman where it's constant hyperbole yeah. uh, hyperbole you know but at the same time on the, the flip side of that coin i think no one owes me uh 30 seconds of their time or interest there are so many people working uh who are talented mm -hmm. um in their closet studios or in their basements and stuff so mm -hmm. finding a way to promote that feels like it's an honest expression of enthusiasm mm -hmm. instead of a high pressure purchase sale to me that seems important because like why would anyone spend I mean, even a book, right? That's like eight hours of somebody's time to read that. 12 hours, of, that's a really big ask. You know, if I were to ask a stranger for 12 hours of their time for free and to pay me 20 bucks for the privilege of giving it to me, that's a big deal. And so, I don't know, I think finding like the breadcrumb path in, you know, for people who might have shared interests feels really important. So mm -hmm. thinking about the, you know, the stolen painting, I mean, in addition to doing the work and really, honing that work and making sure it's the best that you can make it. I think there's also just like a lot of a lot of hoping to get struck by lightning, but there are some behaviors that you can do to make that more likely, you know? Yes. So it's like you know what hills, right? You know what hills to stand on and you spend a lot of time with an umbrella in the rain trying to <laughs> increase the likelihood of that lightning strike. Yeah. I love that analogy. That's just great. Um yeah, and I think um I mean one of the other things I think we're starting to appreciate is that this this myth we've got about you know people's careers being done by the time they're 30 or whatever it is yeah um i think we're starting to see a shift of perspective on that um and you know in the book you talk about about time and and being concerned and about time and age and all that mm -hmm. but you know i'm seeing i mean there was a report just uh two days ago that actually studied the success rate of entrepreneurs you know in silicon valley so tech entrepreneurs and what they found was you know in our mythology is always you know mark zuckerberg emerges from the clamshell and, and facebook is born right and that's so atypical the the more successful entrepreneurs are actually in their middle ages they're in their 40 they're 45 or 50 they're they're using their networks they're using the people around them and they're starting these proportionately much more successful businesses which i thought was really interesting but it's interesting yeah yeah um, so I think I think there's a, a a real shift in in the zeitgeist about what kind of people we're interested in. I think. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm glad to say, and it's interesting. I mean, even in, you know, like music culture and entertainment culture, obviously has like such a a big overlap with the beauty industry mm -hmm. and fashion and stuff. And I admit that I've always had really um, really big concerns <laughs> about that. Um, I do love a beautiful picture. I do love a great shade of lipstick, but just man, the emphasis uh, that we put on beauty, I think does a lot of, I don't know. It sucks. I think it does a lot of harm. I think so. I think, uh, I think that we do have a lot of like, you know, unattainable beauty standards that not in negligible ways mess with people's heads, bodies and health. It makes people sad. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like a lot of, um, a lot of products that really work on fear instead of like, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have this? It's like, yo, you are not good enough the way you are and um, you're irrelevant and all that stuff. So yeah. for all the reasons that you could anticipate, I've got misgivings about that. But I think one of the really cool things that's come under the past year and a half is like, I really do see, even at you know mainstream, walking into Target, like the people who are in photos look different now and it matters more than I thought it would, at least to mm -hmm. me, you know? Oh, um, people are much more aware much more aware yeah much and more. just like i mean i'm also know. doing something about it right which i think is is great it's cool yeah like i think that i think that the the way that we represent ourselves as human beings at least in this you know corner of the world like i can see it becoming more um like a wider more representative array of human faces bodies looks you know and so like hey that's rad that uh i don't know the lines on that lady's thigh who's selling the, the panties at target like i know those lines like <laughs> them out that's kind of cool man uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. and knowing that like young girls and young boys are walking by that too and going oh that's a thigh that's cool uh -huh. i like that uh -huh. yeah that's great i know for myself much more conscious you know like like stuff i used to be kind of oblivious to now i'm just much more conscious about yeah. i don't you know i don't think i was behaving badly i just think i wasn't thinking it wasn't sort of front of mind right the, the whole concern about you know appearance and diversity and yeah. those kinds of things yeah. um 
So um, I thought if you're willing, you know, t- you, 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 you talk about um, music, science and senseless love. <laughs> what have you learned about senseless love? Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, I think it was like, uh, so the, the, that phrase that you just mentioned is like the secondary title of the, the book. That well, you're yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is, yeah, exactly. So the book is called My Own Devices. And then it says it's a book on music, science and senseless love. And to be honest, I think those were like the three themes that were kind of running through a really good chunk of my life um, in my my youth. So like 20s and 30s, being in love with a dude who really didn't serve me to be in love with, Mm. wanting to fall out of it, but not knowing exactly how and wondering if there was something I could do that was more proactive because it just went on for a super long time. Yeah. How long, long were you together? It's like one of those, it's like on again, off again. So it's hard to know how to count it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 totally. But um. I don't know, 15 years, 18 years, something like that. But he got you into rap, right? He did. Uh, yeah. I mean, he was one of the, he was one of the people who, who helped me learn how. So like, you know, I was kind of in first invited to join a rap crew maybe a year before I started working with him and his group, but the group that he was in at the time. But anyway, so it felt all, it was all combined too. I was learning about, you know, this form and this community and how it operated and how it um, was very like tied into social justice which is awesome about most i think um independent hip-hop communities you know lots of artists with strong um opinions uh, no not strong opinions with strong track records of advocacy you know and progressive work um and i was feeling like you know this perseverant love that i can get rid of and learning um about science because i've always i've always i've always been kind of a science kid and so i think some of the big struggles in my life i've tried to understand not only interpersonally so how come i can't fall out of love with sky but also like oh is there a is there a science lens how does love work neuroanatomically Hmm. have people studied that and the answer was absolutely they've studied that and so learning a little bit about the work of um of people like dr helen fisher who would recruit subjects who were in love and put them in fmri machines to see the workings of their brains mm-hmm. as these people contemplated the face of their beloved hmm. yeah it felt like a different kind of vantage point for me and i i've always i've always i don't know it's just part of the way my brain works i think mm-hmm. yeah helen's amazing she's done a ton of stuff um she's I can't, I think she defines herself as an anthropologist, but she's done a lot of, you know, interpersonal psychological work too. Yeah. Really yeah. interesting person. Yeah. Um, and, and have you come to any conclusions? Tentatively perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that, I think that in love as in other parts of our, of our society, um, very often we inappropriately default to kind of our Cartesian understanding of the human organism. Meaning, are you thinking with your head? Or are you thinking with your heart? We use phrases like that, mm-hmm. right? Um, we talk about, you know, kind of intellectualizing stuff or feeling it in our bodies. And I think that we really are an integrated organism. And so a lot of seemingly biological factors that don't seem integral to a particular social problem you know i'm fighting with so and so or i'm still in love with so and so like developing habits like meditation or or just like getting enough sleep you know or drinking less caffeine before you call him like that so many biological factors can inform us trying to be our best selves in interpersonal relationships and i don't just sound i'm not talking generally just about like health and wellness but i mean like really thinking about um about how our bodies are functioning during those moments of interpersonal conflict, you know? So I do pay a little bit more attention to that, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still sort of a lousy meditator, but I do it more begrudgingly now because I do (laughs) reading up and I was like, you know what? A lot of the, a lot of the work that I was most interested, which had to do with like actively changing brain waves, um, can also be achieved without the fancy wires and helmets Mm -hmm. It can also be achieved through different patterns of living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of my um, friends and, and a, a free, frequent sort of visitor to our program here is uh, Rick Goings, who's the former CEO of um, um, Tupperware and a huge advocate for uh, gender diversity and just mm. making opportunities for people. And he meditate, he talks about meditating every day. Um, he, and, yeah. yeah, and he's such an active person too. So I was, I was like, you do that every day. So right, that he takes the time, you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Absolutely. So we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, 
how do we find out more? How do we help you take advantage of this little acceleration? Um, what, what can we do that would, would be useful for you? That is such a kind question. Um, first of all, I guess, yeah, if, if people here are unfamiliar and they would be willing to give me that three minute audition, you know what I mean? To listen to something, I'd be much, I'd be very grateful. Um, and they so go to your name, website? I was gonna say, yeah, my name is Dessa. And if you're on Twitter, I'm Dessa Darling. If you're on things like Instagram, I'm Dessa. And um, I think just a quick Google though. And if you want to Google maybe Janet Yellen and Dessa, you'd, you'd find that. <laughs> oh, the song is totally fun. It's just okay. totally fun. Thanks. And also um, I do have a new podcast with the BBC that's called Deeply Human. So if people want to oh, wow. check that out, they can as well. Mm -hmm. How fun is that? It's cool. <laughs> Oh, I dig it. Yeah. Oh, that that's just great. Well, um, it has been just a super fun time to get to know you. And I am super looking forward to welcoming you to Princeton, um, which is where, where, where we live. Um, and uh, thank you. Uh, it's been a really inspiring conversation.